like to welcome you very warmly in this uh, webinar on behalf of GIZ, German Agency for International Development, and our Fabric program. So um, let me very briefly introduce Fabric uh, to you and also say a few words uh, why we are hosting this new series of, of webinars. So Fabric, as Joost already mentioned, is a program uh, funded by the German government, specifically by the German Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. We are a regional program. Uh, we are working in six countries, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Vietnam, Myanmar, Cambodia, and China. The logic of our program is that um, really a lot of knowledge and experience exists in our region. Uh, and that we can, and that this knowledge can be used uh, to address some of the sustainability challenges in the industry. And while many of uh, the countries or the countries each other see themselves as competitors, there is also, uh, from our point of view, a need and opportunity to work together across country borders to solve some of the major challenges that are confronting the industry even in normal times, and I think you all agree that we are currently not living in normal times. Uh, apart from uh, facilitating regional dialogue, dialogue, we are also uh, working uh, very practically on the ground in our um, partner countries. We are providing, for example, just to mention a few measures as examples, we're providing legal advisory services to women workers, uh, and protected space for them in our women's centers. We are supporting social media campaigns and smartphone apps that are raising awareness and offer information about the labor law. We are working with businesses and labor representatives to support social dialogue and improve industrial relations. So the promotion of regional dialogue is very much at the heart of our approach. And as part of that, we also have initiated and are supporting the STAR network. STAR stands for Sustainable Textiles in the Asian Region. And this is a collaboration of nine producer associations from all our partner countries. We will hear more from them later on. And as part of our effort to promote the regional exchange, we have also initiated this webinar series, which will address on a bi-weekly basis burning issue of this dramatic crisis that we are all currently facing. We think that the dialogue in the region and the dialogue between the different actors in the industry um, is of crucial importance in this historic situation. And we thank you all for participating today and hopefully also in our future sessions as well. So what we would like to, uh, what I would like to do in the following together with my colleague Alexandra is really um, try to present you a very condensed snapshot of the current situation um, in the Asian producer countries. So we will aim to very briefly describe the situation with regard to the current status of the COVID-19, um, the factory closures, uh, how workers are affected, how governments are reacting, and we take a short look at the brand and uh, the consumer side. And just a quick disclaimer, um, of course, um, as you all know, the situation is really changing rapidly and uh, quality data is often difficult to get. So while we tried our best to research the situation, there might be partly differing information depending on the, on the sources. So let me start with some information about the virus um, situation. As you all know, um, you know, there are cases of infections now in all of the producer countries, uh, but the extent is actually very different across the region. There are a number of uh, countries, um, especially also South Asian countries that have a relatively high absolute number of infections. For example, India was almost 28,000, Pakistan was 13,000, in Bangladesh almost 6,000 cases. China, of course, you know that, is still reporting the highest number. However, there are relatively few new infections. Um, the Southeast Asian countries have uh, comparatively lower absolute numbers, uh, with Vietnam, Myanmar, and Cambodia uh, 
still reporting somewhere between 120 and 300 cases. Um, in Cambodia, the situation seems to be improving regarding the infections. Uh, there have been recently tests of over 5,000 uh, quarantined workers who uh, before these tests had been traveled all over the country uh, and there was not one infection uh, detected among these workers. Uh, Cambodia also had no new infections in the last two weeks. However, Cambodia suffers dramatically from the external market conditions, especially order cancellations, and we will come to that uh, very shortly. Uh, when it comes to the uh, situation in the countries regarding lockdowns, uh, we see a mixed picture as well. Uh, Bangladesh, for example, is under a nationwide lockdown until the 5th of May, although some factories um, have been opened now. In Pakistan, there's a lockdown that's extended until May 9th. Um, and in Myanmar, right now, there's no nationwide lockdown, but many townships are under, under a semi-lockdown. Vietnam, um, which like Cambodia had no full lockdown, is being praised for its very effective measures in preventing the spread. And both countries, both Vietnam and Cambodia, so far had no reported um, fatalities. So with regard to uh, factory operations, we uh, also see a mixed picture. Uh, as I mentioned in Bangladesh, we see a partial reopening of factories since last Sunday. In China, 90% of the factories and over 70% of employees are back at work. Uh, in Pakistan, uh, we see that the situation is varying um, depending on the region. Um, the textile factories in Punjab are operational and running at approximately 30 to 40% of their capacities. Factories in Karachi, however, are still not operating due to the strict lockdown. In Cambodia, there were reports just today uh, that 130 factories have closed, at least temporarily, out of 700. And it is expected that this number will grow quickly in Cambodia. In Myanmar, factories are allowed to reopen after an inspection of government authorities. There are reports that 44 out of 600 uh, garment factories had to close so far. So closing factories, of course, means that a lot of workers are losing their job, uh, which is an aspect that Alexandra will cover. So over to you, Alexandra. Thank you. Th thank you very much, Mark. Now, looking at the overall number of workers impacted, first of all, it is to say that it's hard to find reliable overall figures as to how many workers have lost their jobs and also because many workers in the industry, as you know, are daily wages. So we need to be careful with any numbers. However, some reports did make some country based estimates. And to pick a few examples, according to a report by the Center for Global Workers Rights in Bangladesh, it is currently estimated that one million garment workers have already been fired or followed. According to Pakistan Worker Federation, at least half a million textile and garment workers have been dismissed in the Punjab province alone. And we just heard from the report from Cambodia today, 100,000 workers are hit by factory closures in Cambodia. And that means roughly one out of seven. Um, now, what's important to keep in mind is that while wages in the sector are low, they are critical to the livelihoods of the workers and their families. So if we stay with the Pakistan example, where approximately 15 million people are employed in the sector, we must consider that these workers on average nourish six dependents from their income. In countries with weak health and social protection systems, failure to pay workers' salaries um, or to provide income support could quickly impoverish potentially millions of people. So, of course, the resulting risk of social unrest is enormous. Looking at worker layoffs, another problem comes up if we look at Myanmar, where, according to a statement just this morning, over 60,000 workers across the industry have lost their jobs due to factory shutdowns, and where trade unions fear an increase in union busting, listing several examples of factories dismissing only union members. And maybe Kain Zah can tell us a little bit more about that in a bit.
Finally, let me mention on this note that ILO Better Work just published some guides to help factories manage transitioning and retrenchments, which have some valuable advice, including on uh, possible alternatives to job losses. If we now move on to the topic of government reactions, all countries in the region have put in place some sort of stimulus package, varying widely in scope. They contain a variety of measures like direct financial aid, loans with low to no interest rates, tax breaks and so on, and they seek to provide the basic necessities to the poorer parts of the population and to support businesses, SMEs and workers that have lost their jobs. Let's look at some concrete examples again. Cambodia garment workers are now to receive 37% of the monthly minimum wage. That's a total of 70 US dollars per month, 40 of which from the government, 30 from the factories. With that, tens of thousands of garment workers won't be able to send home remittances to their families in the country. So again, talking about dependencies, that will affect hundreds of thousands of more people and further depress the rural economy, which is already faltering under drought and closed borders. In Myanmar, the government has announced an initial stimulus package of nearly 70 million US dollars worth of loans. However, foreign owned companies so far are not eligible for support, yet we have to consider of the 600 or so garment factories in Myanmar, about 75% are in fact foreign owned. In China, we also see that orders that have been cancelled for export are now sold to domestic channels and the government took a number of different measures also to address labor shortage. And an interesting example by one local government is a staff sharing scheme that allows companies to borrow staff from other closed entities. In Bangladesh, the government announced a stimulus package of 8 billion US dollars. It's dispersed in the form of salaries and wages for employees and workers. Cash transfers are planned via mobile financial services and Bangladesh now also plans and conducts food subsidies. Finally, looking at the brand and consumer side, since COVID-19 has turned into a pandemic, also leading to lockdowns, including shop closures in Europe and the US, we see a massive decline in consumer markets. According to McKinsey's The State of Fashion 2020 Coronavirus Update, the average market capitalization of apparel, fashion and luxury players dropped almost 40% between the start of January and the end of March and a much steeper decline than um, that of the actual overall stock market. McKinsey also reports that even online sales have declined, and that's 5 to 20% across Europe and 30 to 40% in the US. We see a lot of public attention on brands' reactions and business practices in this crisis, and brands' reactions are very different. While, my, while some suspended or cancelled purchase orders and um, work in progress orders from sourcing countries in Asia, others, in fact, confirmed taking all orders. We also see many fashion brands have started producing PPEs and also simpler face masks. A big benefit is, of course, that you can keep operating and manufacturing face masks is usually also viewed as essential business. Thus, it may not be um, harmed by any lockdowns. As the impact of the pandemic spreads across the industry, brands and retailers are now also moving from store closures to worker layoffs and fallouts. And we have also heard of executive pay cuts. A number of brands and also multi-stakeholder initiatives, including the German Partnership for Sustainable Textiles, also came together and issued a joint statement. And let me conclude by saying, we don't know what the next month will look like, but we'll definitely achieve more if we all collaborate. Thank you very much and back to you, Ust. Thank you very much, Alexandra and Mark, for this setting the scene. So I think it's time now to introduce our three resource persons or speakers or panelists as you like. And we are very, very excited that they can join us today because they're extremely busy, as you can imagine, given the situation. So um, I would like to start with Mr. Miran Ali. He's the director of Bangladesh Garment Manufacturers and Exporters Association, also known as BGMEA and member of the Star Network of Regional Producer Associations. Miran is also a leading garment entrepreneur 
as the managing, managing director of the Topi Group in Bangladesh. So welcome, Miran. Then secondly, we have Mr. Herman Leung. He's the head of operations of Dakota Garment Group. Um, Herman has been at Dakota, a one-stop solution in garment design and manufacturing company with facilities in China, Cambodia, and Myanmar for more than 10 years. Herman has been responsible for leading the group through different transitions, positioning Dakota with technology and high efficiency in the fashion industry. And over the years, he has continued to explore disruptive changes to the group, like a collaboration with a university using big data to pursue smart AI decisions in the supply chain. So thank you very much for joining, Herman. And last but not least, Ms. Kang Za Ong. She's the president of the Industrial Workers Federation of Myanmar and treasurer of the Confederation of Trade Unions of Myanmar. She left school at 16 to help support her seven siblings. And she got a job in the garment factory in Myanmar at the time and completed a bachelor degree in economics by distance education while working. She has been involved in the trade union movement since 2007. And of course, as a president of the IWFM, she is leading the strategic development of the Industrial Workers Federation of Myanmar and be has become a well known voice representing workers nationally and internationally. So, welcome to you all and happy you could join us today. And let's get right into it as time is of the essence. And I would like to start with Miran. Miram, we already heard some inductory information or figures on the current situation in Bangladesh from Mark and Alexandra, where an enormous number of jobs of textile workers is currently at stake. But I heard also there are some good news happening right now. So you're a producer and also director of BGMEA. So you must be in close contact with many producers in Bangladesh. So how do you assess the situation in Bangladesh and how do members of BGMEA deal with the situation? And are there any good practice and promising trends you can share with us? Miran, over to you. Thank you, Jos. Um, look, one of the things that makes the Bangladesh garment sector unique, um, well, not unique, but interesting, almost all the factories are owned by Bangladeshis. Um, people like myself, who are actually have our roots in this country and have honestly nowhere else to go. We are going to stay here. We are here for the long run. We've been through ups and downs together. Now, what the BJP has done with the collaboration of our international partners and also with a lot of NGO helps and with also with the help of the Industrial Global Union, we have tried to make sure that brands, to the extent possible, brands can't um, divide and conquer uh, with the suppliers. As a supplier, as an individual supplier, if a big Western brand who's a big customer of mine comes to me and demands a 30% discount, as an individual supplier, I'm almost helpless. But by coming together, by using the power of the entire trade body, the BGMEA and the BKMEA, by the way, and as well as our international partners and the trade union partners, we have been able to um, put a lot of pressure um, on customers not to not to do us any favors, by the way, but to comply with the contractual terms. Um, we are not, uh, we, and when I say we, I mean none of these producing countries, none of these suppliers are asking for any favors from anybody. We're only asking to be paid for what we work for. Um, now, while we are in this existential crisis where the whole industry, the whole phase of the industry is changing, one of the interesting things that's happened, uh, oh, and by the way, we shouldn't, um, the number of workers in Bangladesh uh, in the month of April, all factories, almost 99% of factories were entirely closed except for some factories doing production of people. Um, we are doing a phase-wise, area-wise, gradual, um, scaled approach, uh, reopening of the production units with, while maintaining protocols which were developed uh, in collaboration with the ILO Better Works program and also with the Department of Health. Um, we are, while we are doing this phased opening, the workers are now gradually coming back to work and we have requested that people, workers who are coming from out of town do not come to the factory 
and they will not be at risk of losing their jobs or anything like that. Um, our government has stepped forward with giving soft loans for garments factories. Now, and this is the kicker. As an owner of a garments factory, I am taking a loan for the um, in order to pay the salaries of the month of April. But there will be no cash transaction with me or with the worker. The money will be going through mobile financial services directly to the bank account of the worker. So in order to achieve this, the, the mobile financial service providing firms in Bangladesh have, along with the Bangladesh Bank, have relaxed the, the rules for opening bank accounts for workers so that it is easier. For example, if you don't have a birth certificate, you can use an alternative document to prove your identity. But through this, over the last couple of weeks, we have already enrolled about 2.5 million people. 2.5 million workers who are now enrolled in mobile financial services who actually have bank accounts. Now, if there's any silver lining in anything, um, this is going to be one of them. Every single worker in Bangladesh in the garments industry will be paid their uh, um, a certain amount of money for the month of April, um, which will be going directly to their bank accounts without ever having to go to the trouble of carrying cash. So they don't even have to be at their workplace to get paid. And this is something that we're going to ensure. One of the other things that's going to happen is that we must try to um, not only uh, survive this current crisis, but also see where, how are we going to source our raw materials? Because this crisis started with a supply chain uh, shock, and now it's going to a demand side shock. But one of the things that we've learned from this demand shock is it is, it is actually quite interesting when you look at your spectrum of buyers. Southern Hemisphere has not been as affected as Northern Hemisphere. If you are a, customer, if you are a company working with a combination of West and East European supermarkets, uh, customers from New Zealand, South Africa, and Brazil, and big box retailers from the US, you might actually weather this thing uh, far better than others. If I'm working for fast fashion, um, dedicated fashion stores, I'm going to be in for a tough time because that is something we don't know what's going to happen. Um, but in, in, uh, I want to end here with saying that we are finding out who our true friends are. We have a lot of customers, a lot of brands, and I, I'm probably later on going to be indiscreet enough to take names. Um, we have a lot of brands who have always talked to us about sustainability, better buying, uh, uh, responsible sourcing, and this and that, and, and we followed it all, you know, uh, hopefully and sinker. And they were the first to cut and run when uh, push came to shove. And we also have customers who um, never, never uh, uh, said all these things, all these platitudes, who have stood by us. And when I say us, I mean not just myself, but our industry, but all for our, by next to our workers, who are helping us um, overcome this crisis and um, are showing their true partnership. And this is something that we're learning. We are learning who our real friends are this time. Thank, Thank you very much, Niran. Very interesting, and I'm uh, happy to hear that there is uh, things moving in, in Bangladesh and that there is a protocol in place for reopening um, the production. So, um, and also the importance of digital financial services, I found very interesting. Let's move over to Herman Leung. And uh, Herman, you're a producer from Hong Kong with a production in different countries in Asia. You're producing, for example, in Cambodia, you're producing in China, and also in Myanmar. So yeah. as a producer, how, what are your major challenges you face? And um, I would definitely like to learn more about the impact on your human resources, the availability of staff, the use of PPEs, and also how you handle the communication with workers. Herman. Okay, um, so nice to meet you. Thanks for invitations. So um, as you know, we are had uh, multi uh, manufacturing sites across Asia. We have China. Um, Cambodia and Myanmar. So um, this COVID-19 swap us like a perfect storm. So it's just um, start uh, affecting impact in the China. 
So the China unit we have started in, in January and then most, uh, even the worst, they stopped the supply chain, the fabric exporting to our um, Cambodia and Myanmar. So, and the second things come up is um, in March and April. So we also got a lockdown from the countries. So uh, one thing I think is very, I don't, I'm, I'm not saying interesting, but uh, it's very coincident that is hitting us in April for the, for the new year of uh, Cambodia. So the government, um, well, at the, before the day of the common new year, they just announced they canceled the holiday. So um, we have nothing to arrange to the workers to do. Well, so they have to stay, they have to stay in the factories. We have to resume, open the factories. And also at the same time in April in Myanmar. So right now we have to extend the, uh, the new year as well. So is these things always just the opposite running with our two factories. One factories, we have nothing to do for them. So it's just still open. And other factories, we have arranged the things to that in Myanmar, but we have to shut down another two more weeks. So um, this huge impact to us. So in terms of what you're saying is uh, exactly true, is uh, very challenging in arranging the human resources in the, in the and in, in our factories is running. So I, um, we have very difficult time to tell the workers in Cambodia that you are going to cancel the holiday, you're going to, because uh, the government announced it. But you know, um, workers, we have 8,000 more than 8,000 workers in Cambodia. So everybody uh, was just prepared for the holiday and then wait, wait for an, a whole year. And then, uh, but we totally understand the importance of the staying, not doing this mobility um, uh, actions uh, pro across the provinces. So this is very, very, very challenging. But I think um, in that period of time, we have good communications with workers, with the unions. And, and then also we pulled uh, um, also ILO into helping in communications with our, our unions then and our buyers and also were concerned about the situations. Um, then I, at that time we had the good communications that I think it is a key point, transparency and close, close, very close dialogue with our, our unions. And versus uh, Myanmar is also very challenging because we have arranged all our productions already, but everything is stopping and then we, that is a difficult time that also we talk to the workers. We have to explain to them, we still keep open, but now we have to suspend it. And, mm -hmm. and we have more challenging is we talk to the buyers because the buyers, all this shipment is already in, in place, but we can't ship them out because the lockdown is in Myanmar. So this is a um, very, very big challenge where we face very, very totally different different um, situations. So in terms of the PPE, I think it's, it's also very interesting that is um, in the early stage of the COVID-19, we um, in China, there's a shortage of this mask um, uh, thermometer, we have shortage. And then we source these, our, our purchasing office turned it into another purchasing uh, office of these medical uh, supplies. Then we source, we hardly source these masks from Cambodia, and then we ship the masks to China. And after that, when China getting stable, we, sh we source the masks from China and going to uh, shipping to Myanmar and China, uh, Cambodia as well. So I think in this whole operation, we've seen that was a lot of time that we can, we can compensate each other, different countries. So these supplies, when they need it, and how you can help them, and eventually they were helping them back again. So um, I think these two are the uh, very, very interesting uh, interactions that lessons that we learn, we still keep learning. But um, you know, in the future, so what what will be, we we'll still keep an eye close on, uh, keep an eye on it. Yeah. Thank you very much for sharing, Herman. A lot of challenges you are facing as a producer. And but um, you mentioned uh, Myanmar, you mentioned uh, talking to, with the trade unions. So we are very happy to have Kang Za on with us. She's the president of the Industrial Workers Federation of Myanmar, as I mentioned. So I'm sure she, you are very, very busy these uh, times, Kang Za. And we have already heard a lot about the impact of the, 
of the crisis on production, but production cannot take place without workers. Yet they are the last part in a long and complex supply chain, and their voice is often not heard very much. So you are out in the industrial zones and speak with garment workers in Myanmar probably every day. So how is their situation and what are their main concerns, their fears, their hopes? Can you share a little bit of what's happening in Nia and in Yangon and in Myanmar in general? Over to you, Kengza. Kengza, are you there? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to this event. Uh, the worker situation in Myanmar, the workers are uh, uh, losing job in, uh, in a ways of layoff and uh, factory closures. Uh, the reason for the lack of raw material shortage is happening happen in the January, February, in March. Now, uh, another reason for they are, they are losing job. Now over 100 factories are lay, closed or lay off in the list. About 25,000 workers are losing job. This is our list. We are asking the government how many, how many factories are closed and how many workers are losing job, but we do not get the information. So we are pushing the government to give uh, information to us. And uh, also the right to freedom association is under attack. Union members are targeted to lay off without having consultation in the cases of layoff in the factory closure. And also another issue is the income security. Workers are not paid accordingly the cash benefit they used to get monthly. By saying lack of lack of material or a cancellation of factory do not get paid for the finished goods or products in process. Currently, Myanmar is now having 150 COVID-19 positive patients. Myanmar need to lock down for temporary and prepare to prevent uh, virus spreads. Especially in factories and township where industry zones are located. Non factory are stay open without complying with the Ministry of Health guidelines. Also, Ministry of Labor released an announcement on 90 of April the, uh, that said the factory will be allowed to reopen after inspection, after having inspection and giving permission. In Myanmar 10 to 19 was water festival holiday. The announcement mentioned that the factory will be reopened after getting permission. However, many factories yes, are still open. Yes, temperature of the washout of, of the bath. And the second one are water insulin inside. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you well. Thank you. Can I continue? Okay. Yes, please continue. Yeah. Uh, the factory has stay opening. Uh, we have sent about, uh, we have sent complaint about 80 factories to the government during the week. So occupational safety for the workers is weak. <laughs> Worker are worried about virus infection. Since the workers are crowded, masks and face sheet hygiene are not provided, as well as cannot exercise the social distancing at the workplace. And also workers are under pressure. Since the end of April, set the hotline phone number to provide information and give, an, give advice to the workers. We got hundreds of phone calls from the workers during a week. And as they do not need to go to work, 
because of uh, bias, but they are managers, supervisors, are calling them to come to work. If they do not go, they will be dominated or their salary will be cut for the 10 holidays uh, from 10 to 19. Many workers also said that they, they have to go to work because they need to earn money for, to support their families. So workers are uh, worried about the living. During 20 to 30, workers are not granted how they were how they were paid. Employers are saying they were not paid because the government, it is the government announcement. And uh, no what no pay, they are saying. And then there's a, there is a duration you can take uh, leave without pay. So today, uh, this morning, we received the, the an, uh, statement from the Ministry of Labor. It said that the worker who has temporarily stopped working during 20 to 30 will be provided 40% of cash of daily wage, which they will contribute mentally to Social Security Fund. So there is no grant grantee for after 30 of April. Three days ago, there was there was uh, a case, a COVID-19 positive patient found in a huge factories in the biggest industry zone in Myanmar, where more than 8,000 workers are working. Uh, on 25th, workers were asked to come to work in that factory. About uh, 2,000 workers came to work and they were asked to go back home about 11 a.m. when the case is confirmed from that factory. Workers who were back home were not allowed to enter to the villages, to their host hostels, to the quarters. That again, who allow enter to the villages are not allowed to go out. So workers are now losing jobs. They quit from jobs without having any compensation or cash support. Workers who do not even lose job are not granted, they will get paid. So in conclusion, workers are really hope for job in income security as well as they will be asked to work in, uh, to work in safe working condition, uh, especially physically and mentally. Thank you. Thank you, Kengza, for sharing the, the very serious situation in for workers in Myanmar. Um, let me go back to Herman first. Um, as you mentioned, you are producing in different countries in the region. Do you see any differences in how they address the pandemic? And are there any good practices or approaches you can, can highlight for us? And uh, I want to remind all our um, participants that you can ask questions in the chat, please. There are two colleagues helping me to, to, uh, to collect these or bundle these questions. And maybe for the sake of time, I would ask also our uh, three speakers to keep the answers now a little bit shorter so that we have enough time to interact with the audience. Thank you very much. And over to Herman. Um, yes, I think uh to to the different countries they uh react uh differently but i can see that still um very appreciate seeing uh government giving um incentives or what it says uh is the the pay for the workers for just mentioned about the cambodian government and Myanmar government uh, they are they are giving certain uh wage pay for when they have uh, no job during this uh, period, but uh, we appreciate for that. And then I think one thing I want to stress is here um, is, well, I, I don't see a very, I, I don't know how to say it's a good practice of projects is right here because everybody is suffering. But um, what we see, we will see is if, if we can hold on together. So that is what we exactly experiencing. For example, this is when we face the COVID-19. So we need to avoid to fall into the game theory trap. What I mean is game theory trap is everybody is trying to protect themselves. 
everybody, um, for example, buyers trying to protect themselves, cutting the orders, um, uh, not paying the suppliers, and also the suppliers, they are also the, uh, cutting the payments for their tier two suppliers, or even they lay off the workers. And then for for the for the workers, they are trying to fight back, strike, and all these things. It has a very very big um, disruption to all these not only the industries along the whole supply chain. So what what, what we are thinking is, we, well, our way we're thinking is we need to break this uh, game theory trap. We need to think, uh, I think, in the opposite way. One is um, we at Dakota, we face this huge challenge was we just mentioned it. And then how we've handled it is um, we as a top management, we got volunteer 20% wage cut. You know, at, at, at the moment right now, I'm having 20% wage cut until the situation gets better. But um, surprisingly, when we announced that this to our our workers, to our, our, our middle management that we got very positive feedbacks and support from our 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 people, and then they even the man, middle management they volunteer to get the same wage pay cut, and which contribute the company because um, eventually we have to suspend the factories in May at the time before we we plan for that. But after we get we agreed to everybody to give a little bit uh, contributions wage cut to the whole whole company then we don't have to lay off any one of our workers. We don't have to lay off any single of our even clerk or, or anybody. So I think these surprisingly create a very, very positive um, mm -hmm. uh, energy to, to, to the whole company. I mean, these things can actually not do my own company, actually for the industry. So everybody could strike back. Could, could recover back very quickly. And then what I'm trying to say is um, COVID-19, um, that is, I, I mean, it's scary. There's a disease, there's a fatal one. But um, the most scary thing is, is the people response to, how do they respond to this COVID-19, the actions they're doing, the negative response, um, the protective actions that they're all doing all these things is more scary than the disease itself. So what I'm trying to say is um, that is the value at the showing that what are you holding? Instead of um, are you speaking, are you is just talking the values? But well, when, when we all facing the COVID-19 and not everybody is doing what they say. Um, I cohere with Miran said, I said, I'm not saying who is good friends or not good friends at the moment, but I'm saying is um, how we could work out together and look for a long term interest in, instead of a, a, a short term sacrifice. So this also um, uh, I think is coherent with uh, theory of game theory as a behavior of uh, consistent, yeah, time inconsistent of their behavior. So if the, mm -hmm. uh, you're looking for long term, you're looking for a right way to do the right thing at the moment of time, and then we all need to sacrifice short term. One more thing I want to add in is, um, even though we now we don't have to sus suspend the factories in May because um, we we struggle a lot, we talk to a lot of clients, and some of the clients help to fit in the orders. So we super appreciate for that. But the thing is, um, the price was wrong. The price is wrong. Is is these are not the right price to place in the Cambodian or Myanmar index. Is it's not right the weight? So we suffer loss as well. But what one we want to say is, we want to keep the workers. We want to keep the factories running. We don't want to lay off any single one of them. So even though there was a loss orders, so we still take it. We want to keep everything still running, but. Of course, we have to have a wage pay cut, but we, we are happy to do it if we can keep all these things. If we just have 20% wage cut and we can get over COVID-19. So I would say is um, a certain of buys of brands, um, you please don't take advantage on right here at the moment. But I know they're also suffering. So as I said, we don't fall into this trap, game theory trap. So we got to stay on hold together and time will go on, everything is gone, uh, COVID-19 will go away, and then 
uh, I think that was um, even better future for us. Yeah. Thank you, Herman, and sharing your thoughts about game theory and how you personally with Dakota handling the situation. Um, maybe I go over to Miran. You're not only part of VGMEA, but you're also part of this uh, network of regional producer associations that Mark has introduced as STAR, a STAR as in sustainable tech stars in the Asian region. So you're in exchange with other producers from other countries. So where do you see common issues in the current crisis and especially where do you take actions together? Like Herman has given an example. Can you share some thoughts? Yeah, sure. Maybe two, three minutes. Um, you know, Yoska, in the past, before the, the GIZ and the Fabric Project set up this organization, this group of us, this network of six countries comprising of all the associations of these six countries, um, prior to that, the best way that, um, you know, a brand would scare us and make us behave and eat our dinner would be to tell us that Cambodia is cheaper, Myanmar is cheaper, Vietnam is cheaper, China is cheaper, Pakistan is cheaper. Now, what's happened is things are different. Um, because of this network, we actually have a platform where six nations representing more than the majority of the world's global production actually sits together and we talk to each other not as uh, competitors or enemies or pirates coming to steal my clothes, but um, actually friends who we can collaborate with, who we can find common ground with. Um, and this, this has actually been a very good learning experience for myself and for all my other colleagues on the network as well. We have actually taken lessons that we've learned from there and applied it within our own businesses um, throughout these last couple of years that we've been together. And what we are going to do is we are trying to collaborate, and I, I, I don't know if you've seen that we have brought out a joint statement, um, because you want, we do not want the brands to come and say to us that, well, Vietnam has accepted these terms, why can't Bangladesh or Pakistan accept it? The terms have to be fair to both the producers and to the workers, because at the end of the day, you bankrupt the producers, you also make the workers suffer. It is not possible for governments of these producing countries to continue to bail out their factories for liabilities that are not the fault of the government. Now, Bangladesh's government has actually done quite a bit in making sure that the, the, the impact on the workers, at least initially, is going to be um, somehow cushioned. We are also talking to our glo the global network, obviously with the European Union and with the uh, specific European governments. Uh, the German and the Dutch specifically, on other packages, uh, unemployment benefits, because there is going to be a change um, in this industry moving forward. Plus, one of the things that the BGME had done in the last few years, in, the, in our, uh, our last board, we have formed something called the TCC, Tripartite Consultative Committee, made up of government officials, Ministry of Labor, industry representatives, and trade union representatives. And this body meets to discuss these pressing issues. What do we do about factories that can't pay? What do we do about those factories that uh, need to get money? How do we deal with this? We are trying to oppose this in a collaborative way to try and make sure that all the players, all the stakeholders are, we might not agree at the end of the day, but we must hear each other out. On, um, and I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to answer a question that I saw, which is interesting. Um, on a national level, this is the TCC. On an international level, as BGMA, we work with Action Collaboration Transformation, ACT. Now, I'm sorry, we're going to drown you with acronyms. ACT is a body which was set up to um, try to bring on more responsibility in purchasing practices. And um, we, have, we work with um, international uh, global trade unions global brands, as well as the BGMA, we are all a part of this and we've been having extensive discussions on how we can, um, how we can have some semblance of responsibility and sanity in, in addressing the situation. Um, and finally, um, regionally, what we do is we have the star network. So it, it's a multi, it's a multifaceted approach. What, what we must also um, ensure is that I, as a producer, don't try to cut, uh, undercut the person next door. And I 
as a country, don't try to undercut another country and have this um, unending spiral downwards. We want to maintain standards. We have all these countries have achieved certain standards of production and industrial safety. We must make sure that these are maintained. There will be a shakeup in the industry. It will be a different scenario, but we must make sure that the workers are um, secure in the employment as much as possible. And I qualify that statement because it's unfortunately not going to be shell rosy going forward. I think I've, I've, I've passed my, my limit. Thank you, Miran. Um, so I'm going straight to King Zha because um, you talked about collaboration, Miran. You talked about multi-stakeholder dialogue. So King Zha in, in Myanmar, for healthy industrial relation, the dialogue between management, workers, and their representatives is critical. So in times of crisis, that's even more important, as we have just learned from Miran again. Um, do you find many cases where worker representatives or trade union leaders are involved in negotiations in the factories? And I saw a question coming in. Um, is there a social dialogue among the producers, government and trade unions responding to COVID-19 outbreaks to protect the garment workers of the um, economic impact? So um, can you share a little bit what's uh, what's happening on the Myanmar side? Yes, we have um, a Trabadai meeting on 25th of March. Uh, we discussed about the this issue. Uh, trade, we trade union proposed the government uh, for the uh, preparation uh, in terms of to prevent COVID-19 uh, via spread and uh, to prepare the factories uh, to be safe working place. So, and uh, our proposal to, to close the factory temporarily and to prepare the factory. So, uh, during, for that, for that, uh, our support for the salary to the workers. Uh, in April, we have uh, we have the water festival holiday ten days, so that the employer have to pay them to the workers. So we urge government to use social security fund to support workers uh, for sixty percent. So employer pay forty percent to the workers. In this way, uh, we can uh, temporarily close the factory for one month, uh, so that. The, the, we after after April after, after April we will have a working uh, safe working place and then uh, we have uh, control the bias suppress. Why we are saying that in uh, before March 20 we do not have any cases the, uh, the COVID 90 cases, but uh, on 20 21 22 we have a uh, migration coming back uh, the migrant people who are working in other country coming back. We cannot uh, put them under uh, quarantine. So th those migrant big workers are going back to the regions and the industries. So that's why we are seeing maybe there will be some case. So on 24, we have, uh, we found, that's why we have proposed it. But the intrapagai meeting, uh, our proposal are not considered. It is not uh, uh, implemented, and uh, there is no any proposal from the employer and government. There was no, and then now we do not have uh, any any Tabadai mechanism. Uh, Tabadai meeting again, but uh, mm -hmm. we do have Tabadai dialogue the first I see really, and I know I have. And about 90 uh, trade union bars and 90 factories. But now we have only 60, uh, about 60 member factory because of layoff and factory brochure. We lost many. So uh, in the first week, first week of April, we have a negotiation with the management in different factories. So we got the agreement. So I will say the agreement uh, workers take uh, employer pay for uh, 60 days because 10 days, holidays, 
and uh, four day working days and two Sunday off. And uh, the rest of 40 days, worker agreed to take leave, uh, annual leave or annual leave. Some worker does not have an annual leave, so they, they took leave without pay. So they, they have uh, closed the factory for one month. During that time now, before April 30, what trade unions are doing? They now approaching to the, uh, their employer and then discuss what factory has done for the preparation. So the union and factory, they have a, they have a checklist and then they see they have to manage the workforce. So they, they would like to, they, they now request to IWF and they would like to meet with us and to get some suggestion to manage the workforce, to be in line with the uh, MOHS Ministry of Health guideline. So I, I, I will say it is very good uh, having a dialogue at the factory level. So worker can work in safe place, uh, factory can continue their business. Yeah, and also we can maintain job security for the workers. But it is very few happening in Myanmar because union density in Myanmar is very low. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Kang Zha. So um, maybe quick final question. How is your cooperation going with the international trade union movement going? I mean, is there some support? Uh, we are a member of the industry all. Uh, regarding with the uh, to to get the better situation during the crisis for the government industry, government workers, we are now work, uh, working with the industry and the ad member brands. Mm -hmm. uh, we are now discussing about the ad action plan uh, to make sure the freedom of association, right to freedom association, wage and uh, the wage security, something like that. Thank you, Kangza. So I'm looking at the time. It's uh, seven past wherever you are, most likely, except I think if you're in Nepal and in, in some other countries with, which has a different time zone. So um, I see also questions coming in. Maybe, uh, however, maybe two short answers from, from Miran and from, from Herman before we open up for questions. And my colleagues are very busy trying to bundle questions for me. So. Um, Maybe uh, Miran, maybe you're you as a as a member of STAR, as a producer, as a member of BGMEA and other associations. You're observing also what happens in other countries. So where do you see good strategies and approaches to tackle the crisis? Maybe you can highlight one or two. Um, <clears throat> well, from a national point of view. From a national point of view, it's been our collaborative approach, um, sort of like a big tent approach that we've done in Bangladesh, um, which has been, I think, something that other countries should follow as well. Obviously, the fact is that um, uh, Bangladesh, particularly Bangladesh, Pakistan, are very strong in the fact that it's, it's, a, it's a nationally owned industry, primarily. Um, and that was going to be a challenge more in, in Myanmar and Vietnam. But um, I think collaboratively, what we can do is where we can collaborate is actually going to be in our reaction to the global uh, changes in buying patterns, to the changes in, especially in payment terms that we are now getting shoved down our throats, um, also to changes in the way um, we collaborate with each other. Now, the, there's going to be a limit on the, the, the good practices that we can follow in each country because obviously labor laws and everything like that. But, um, and also the government's role itself is different. But I do believe that the biggest area of collaboration is going to come in the uh, aspect of um, the sharing of the approach that we have towards the brands, and also in terms of better management of our uh, production systems. But, um, Bangladesh, for example, particularly, has always been more geared towards volume, big volume. If you've got a million pieces, you come here first. But we want to we need to re-engineer ourselves to be more efficient, to be able to be more reactive and to be able to work for those companies, for those countries. Because one of the questions I noticed somewhere was new markets. 
a new market is going to be one of the most important things. Forget buyers diversifying and de-risking. I am going to diversify and de-risk first. And the first thing I'm going to do is, you know, turn up in Herman's door and start selling something in China. Um, I need to sell in China, I need to sell in India, I need to sell in South America, South Africa, um, everywhere. Um, I need to sell across the spectrum of um, from fashion brands to supermarkets to big box retailers. We worry later about whether European, West European buyers are going to be de-risking. First things first, manufacturers are going to de-risk and there's going to be a shakedown, not only of manufacturers, but of brands moving forward. Because when you've showed your true colors now, come back to me after six months with a uh, 100,000 piece order, your price has gone up 50 cents at least. And I think Herman is gonna stick with me on this. And the other thing about, before I leave finally, is going to be IT systems. Um, blunt force production, simply pushing out more pieces with more manpower, with more people in the lines, that's not gonna work. We have to intelligently use um, the talent that we have in each of our countries and also have the proper IT systems put in place so that we can uh, clear our production systems and improve our efficiencies. That's where we're going to make money. That's where we're going to save money. Thank you. Yost, I think you're on mute. That's true. That's, I was too clever. I, um, thanks very much, Miran. And um, I'm going straight to, to Herman for a last question. And I already continue also then add on an additional one for him because I see questions coming in for Herman as well. So um, you have led Dakota through various transitions, Herman, and you have been implementing a short answer. Can you give us one example where digital technologies have helped you through this crisis or technology we should uh, we should look at to make sure that we are more resilient for future similar crises? Um, yes, I think um, a lot of people, yeah, we are using a lot of technologies right now. So um, if you, we are, if we, we understand correctly now, COVID-19, that means fast change. That means we have to deal with fast changing. For example, you have to deal with yesterday they placed a million of orders, but today they cancel of them. And tomorrow they'll place it again. You never know these things, how this is going to happen. And how it's going to be happening in the country that suddenly extend the holiday or suddenly they cancel the holiday. So I think to the technologies we are having right now to deal with the COVID-19 we're having, I think we biggest uh, what I could say is helping is we uh, vow our technologies, we know ourselves very, very well. For example, for our production line, we fit with the RFID technologies. Uh, so we actually, we developed um, this app on uh, online. So in the, every single minute in our, even in our top manager, the cell phones, we understand how the uh, factory's production status that is. And secondly, well, we have this um, electronic attendance records from the from the workers, and then we know so what today, how many workers were coming in, how many they are working in absence, and second, uh, third, we have the system that is in place as uh, Microsoft BI, so the business intelligence system that can actually actively tell us, tell ourselves how we should respond to the capacity of the factories. So, you know, and also finally with the, our ERP system, the ERP system giving you a very good figures than how you're uh, managing your supply chain, my supply chain, my fabric meals, are they uh, placed the order to them or uh, did they ship out the orders already? Because we are going, we, we have every changes in every single minute. So while finally we will say is these are basically, I, I think a lot of people also, they have this system, but the, 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 nowadays, we can we need to go a step up forward. It is how we can use these separate systems information to grab into together into one system and to giving you um, smart AI decisions that telling you that today your clients is going to cancel 
uh, half million pieces. So what you're going to do? So you from the system, you're going to understand yourself very well. That is okay. So now we understand we haven't produced it yet, or if this is already in the production line, if they cut yet, and how is the efficiency acting on? What is what are the difference between Cambodian and Myanmar? Do we still have enough time to change the the container, the fabric of containers from Cambodia shipping to Myanmar or shift back to China. And this is quick actions helping us to make um, one minute decisions with this dramatic change. Because I think we have to cooperate together with the buyers, with the clients very, very co closely and understand the challenges they are facing. And then we give the best support to them. This is more importantly than I'm trying to start to think how should I lay off my workers so I close my factories. Because I think now until the last minute, you might totally change the decision from suspend two factories to reopen it again. So this is as a, as a race to the time that is a matter how we can, um, I think is get an advantage from today's uh, digital technologies. So I, I'm just adding on one more example is when is especially we work on very fast orders, very fast fashion trend of that. Just like we are raising, we are running with a car very, very closely ahead of us. And then we are the second car. And the third car behind me is the fabric mills, the tier two supplies. And when the first car hit the brake, and if we're getting too close to them, we're gonna hit very hard. Two of these cars are going to be collisioned very hard and crash together. So what now the point is, if we get very close to the first car, we need to have a very, very good visibility, very, very good transparency to seeing what is the first car is seeing from ahead. And these mm -hmm. things connect together, well, can help you to survive in, in, in this big disaster. At least I think can make you um, uh, cut, uh, uh, reduce a lot of losses uh, right there. Yeah. So, given the time, I want to fire shoot a few questions, and I need as much as possible short answers because we have a 90 minute uh, time slot, and we have only 50 minutes left, and we yeah. still have Stephen Frost giving us three key takeaways in three minutes. So maybe a questions to Miran and Herman, both of you short answer. Are you planning to invest in new markets due to COVID-19 and in backward integration to reduce your dependency on singular countries like China and India? Okay. So has, who would like to go first? Quad short answer. Herman? You first, you first. <laughs> We, uh, we as an industry are looking at um, having further backward linkage, particularly when it comes to man-made fibers, because Bangladesh is only 90% uh, vertical when it comes to knitwear, uh, circular knitwear. We are already over 6% um, integrated when it comes to denim, but when it comes to man-made fibers, synthetic fabrics, that's where we are uh, falling short. So that is where we see investments. We do not see uh, uh, any or a great deal of investment by Bangladeshi factories um, in uh, outside of Bangladesh. We still believe that this country has so much to offer, and we still believe that we can, uh, with a more integrated supply chain, continue to um, be competitive. Uh, but yeah, sorry. Herman, on to you. <laughs> um, for me, I think we'll keep continue expanding in Myanmar. We will start Myanmar is three years ago, is having a very, very good uh, development and we see it very positively in Myanmar. So, um, but of course, uh, Cambodia, we're still keeping, keeping on, just like what today we are seeing, it is um, Myanmar and Cambodia, we both compensate together. We just like two brothers, we work together. Um, thirdly, uh, Personally, I'm very interested in Africa, but I, I, I mean, um, it's the next rising star for certainly. But um, when the right climate is coming for the globally, that will be a blooming. But uh, I still believe in Cambodia, Myanmar, um, China is uh, our basement. Yeah. So I think your sound is gone. So the last sentence, one more time. Uh, last sentence is uh, Africa. 
I think we still also consider Africa is a very, very good place to go with in the future of time. But of course, uh, Cambodia, Myanmar, China will still be in place on here and continues to to develop their own unique um, advantage and strength of these countries. Mm -hmm. um, also questions for you, Herman. I get some questions here to you about uh, the impact on your business, including if some brands have canceled any orders and yeah. how is there the, the brand's buyer commitment to the worker and the factories? And last but not least, um, what is your opportunity for short-term sacrifices you mentioned you made, right? I mean, keeping every worker and so on. Uh -huh. Miran, talk a little bit about that. Herman, what's what's your yeah. take? Um, I think I th uh, some of the buyers, they do cancel their orders, but um, I think some of them, some of them, they do give uh, liabilities and guarantee on the, on the raw materials and that. But of course, uh, the raw materials is not going to produce the same orders. It's going to be changed, styles going to change, uh, the price, all these terms is going to be uh, renegotiated. And Fabrix is already arrived at my fabric warehouse, and I'm going to pay for the fabric uh, supplier first before I have a right order for them. But um, in terms of, we don't, again, I don't want to um, invest, in this, but we don't fall into the trap is, I'm, I'm, I'm paying the supplier first before I get new payments. So it's using our own capital. So the opportunity cost is high, it's huge, because we are taking out our own capital to pay for this and we look for for that. But you know, this is the future, um, the fashion. We don't have crystal balls. We don't know if we can use those fabric back, but we trust our buyer, we trust them to do it. Uh, um, for the workers, I think, uh, for different governments like Cambodia government, Myanmar government, well, uh, it's already been in place that I'm paying part of the wages. And then we, when, when the things is coming back and work coming back, so we, we will uh, we will still uh, try our best to keep all the factories running. We, even though the price of the orders don't have margins or suffer loss, or we have to, to pay for our, our, the price is not enough to pay for the workers. We still pay for them. We still take the orders. We hope eventually this thing is gone and and then um, our workers, at least they don't affect it because we, we keep all the things still running. Yeah. Um, question to Kang Za. I mean, uh, are there any special demands from the government uh, you would like to, to highlight one more time? I mean, what are the demands to the government to support workers in these kind of crisis beyond what you have mentioned so far? Anything you would like to add? Is there any? And then I would probably go with a with a fortune fortune teller question or the glass bowl <laughs> question to all of you to wrap it up. And uh, we we need the government to support the workers, to support us, so that, that we uh, suggest to use social security fund to support the workers during the crisis. And also no, um, and also government need to enforce the law and the guidelines to prevent COVID-19. So that, uh, so that uh, we, have, we will have the better health recovery. So we can make sure for uh, faster economic recovery which means the social and economic, we can make the social and uh, economic uh, stabilities in this uh, industry. And we also need uh, the support from the brand. Because it is very important, we alone cannot go uh, overcome this uh, crisis. So that we really need uh, the brand to, to take an action on one payment payment on the wages of the wages in the immediate uh, to mid -down. And the second payment of outstanding orders to suppliers so that they can pay for their wages. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the brand have two avenues to support uh, wages in their supply chain. Uh, we will suggest number one, they have high and large significant liquidity through their financial dealing to provide 
some cash. And the second, they can provide letters to letters of credit to approach the international financial institution together with the government for loans. Thank you. Thank you, Kaiza. So quick question to Miran and to maybe to Herman as producers. Last question, very short answer. Are they uh, what is your your um, yeah the glass bowl? You know, look in the glass bowl and tell us what is your estimation the possibility of recovery in the, for 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 the global apparel industry after the pandemic? And so, what do you think? Are we recovering soon? Next year? Many years? Who would I, like to go first? Shall I? Um, Herman and I are both very lucky that we are both actually a part of another small group um, where we work with probably one of the best companies in the world, and um, or probably definitely the best company in the world as far as their parallel is concerned. And there are, we can see that there are people who are going to be yeah, moving forward, there will be brands which will continue to strive to grow, to do well, and they will have suppliers who will remain loyal for the years to come. You will also have brands, and and let's let's throw out a name for for fun, for fun right? So you got um, you think S3 gets out of this uh, crisis and comes back to me as a buyer and is going to get terms that are going to be viable? It's not. Um, so suppliers are also um, people who have memories. So we are seeing who's loyal now. Um, brands which stand by their supplier factories and their workers are going to be the ones who will flourish moving forward. But we will have a shakedown. We will have, um, there will be some people who will no longer be in the business anymore. And we must make sure that in the case of suppliers that those workers are given a transitional uh, support to move either to other factories or to other employment, because the reality is Bangladesh has 2.8 or 3 million people. On the short run, we may not actually be able to employ all of them. So we will need some sort of support, and the same thing will happen in Myanmar, in uh, Cambodia, in Vietnam, in every, every producing country. So this is something that is going to be necessary. There's going to be a level of unemployment support necessary for uh, the workers in our countries. Um, otherwise, we must make sure we do not go back to business as usual. Business as usual did not work. It has ended up with us paying for tier two, which means our raw materials, before I get paid for my final product. And now when the final product is canceled, I'm left with a, a warehouse full of fabrics that I can't use because they've been dyed in a color which it was for a specific customer who doesn't want it anymore. So mm -hmm. we must make sure that the, the, the business moving forward is done in a more sustainable manner and with better uh, buying practices to which people must comply with. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Miran. Yeah, I'm, yeah I'm, I, I'm absolutely agree with Miran's point of view that is um, um, during this COVID-19, eventually it will, it will finish, it will pass away. And um, we should be learning a lessons right here. And these lessons is more than the mask, more than the uh, sanitizers, wash your hands. More than that is how, what is value we embrace. And um, well, when we talk about these values and um, when, when crisis came, um, what did we perform? How did we do it? What action did we took? And then um, now is when everything passed, should we go back to normals? Should we uh, forget everything? Should we just lock it into the old uh, practices that we have been making? Um, that should be something we should be learning. But I think that once if we learn that, the whole supply chain will be getting more resilient. And the system between um, your own, own factories will be more robust and then the relationship between um, we and the buyers and your clients and your fabric mill supply chain should be improving more so positively because I think this is a lesson that that the earth uh, is giving us that we should uh, remember something positively and then making uh, correcting our old habits uh, our old habits and making it uh, better right the world. 
And then uh, I think, so for, for us, we still feel very positively. So when we getting better, when we overcome these old habits, and then we go into this, so the whole supply chain, the fashion, the industry, we will get there yeah, much, much better. Yeah. Thank you very much, Herman. Uh, we are coming to the end of our seminar time. I hope you can stay five minutes with us more. And I, um, I wanted to, to share my screen for a second because I wanted to introduce you to um, Dr. Stephen Frost. Uh, he is actually a professor at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. He is also director of Go Blue, a sustainability accelerator for apparel and textile companies. He co-founded CSR Asia, and last but not least, he's uh, the editor for the Fashion Sustainability Week in Review. So he's, he's actually checking all the time what's happening, and he's listening in to our um, webinar very carefully, not only as an observer, but as a co-organizer. Stephen, um, what are the three key messages or key takeaways you noticed from our conversation today? Can you help us? to learn from your experience? Uh, I, I think everybody can learn from just listening to these three people. But if I have to sum it up in, in three key major takeaways, this is what I would say. Um, the first one is there's a new era of working together. Um, things are not going to go back together. Um, Miran talked about uh, the STAR collaboration, um, talking about uh, countries working together, talking about suppliers working together. And the need for for everybody across this entire value chain to take some sacrifice, to um, give up a little. Uh, as Herman said, um, not to get bogged down in game theory um, and trying to uh, save yourself and get the best deal but harm others in the process. Uh, the second thing is um, there's a new way of doing things, whether it's going to be speeding up changes like mobile payments um, and bank accounts for workers in uh, Bangladesh, or whether it's um, how the relationship between uh, brands and suppliers will shake out um, in the next couple of years. It's not going to go back to business as usual. And it's going to be very interesting to see how that works. But if we put that together with the first learning, which is working together and seeing the supplier countries and the suppliers working together and having a more united front towards buyers, that's going to be very interesting. Um, many years ago, I toyed around with the idea of starting a, um, a, a united front organization for, uh, for factories, but people didn't really want to listen. But now times have changed. And then the third one is a kind of a big issue, um, which is something that Herman um, mentioned, which is to know yourself. And to be honest, what I hear here is a bit of um, Chinese philosophy from Sun Tzu, uh, the art of war. Um, I don't know whether Herman had that in mind when he says um, to know what you're really capable of. Um, the art of war does does mention, uh, pay quite a bit of attention to um, before you really know your enemy, uh, you should really know yourself. Uh, right. And if you know both yourself and your enemy, then you have a much greater chance of victory. But if you only know your enemy, but not yourself, your chances of victory uh, halve. So I think uh, it's it, it's become imperative for, for suppliers to know what they have to do. Um, Miran talked about uh, Bangladesh no longer relying completely on on brute force. Um, uh, Kangzar talked about um, the unions, you know, being, you know, having to uh, be involved in uh, relationships with uh, with both both the factories, but also have some kind of say in what the brands are doing too. Um, so that's my my three takeaways. You know, working together, new ways of doing things, and uh, for not just the suppliers, but for everyone, I think, to know themselves clearly. Thank you very much, Jost. Back to you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Excellent. And um, I already put another slide up. Now, save the date, next webinar.